The Guns of Navarone is a 1961 British-American epic adventure war film directed by J. Lee Thompson. The film was actually one spoke in a wheel of mega-budget World War II adventures that included The Bridge Over the River Kwai, The Longest Day, and The Great Escape. The screenplay, written by producer Carl Foreman, was based on Alastair McLean's 1957 novel of the same name. His inspiration for writing the novel came from the Battle of Leros Island in the Aegean Sea during the fall of 1943. The book and the film both share the same basic plot, and that is a team of allied saboteurs are assigned the impossible mission of infiltrating an impregnable Nazi-held island and destroying two massive long-range field guns that are preventing the rescue of 2,000 trapped British soldiers. The film stars Gregory Peck, David Niven, Anthony Quinn, along with Stanley Baker, Anthony Quayle, Irene Pappas, G. Scala, and James Darren. The movie was one of the first so-called global productions, which meant its cast was purposely put together from a variety of countries in order to appeal to the widest possible audience at the international box office. The film, along with The Magnificent Seven, would influence many later films and the television show Mission Impossible, where a team of specialists are brought together, each one of them bringing his or her personal skill, which distinctly contributes to the success of a perilous mission. While reading the best-selling novel, Columbia Pictures head Mike Frankowitz became excited about its big screen possibilities. He showed it to producer Carl Foreman, who was under contract with Columbia, and he wasn't too enthusiastic about it at first. He just feared how difficult making a movie version would be. After further consideration, though, Foreman changed his mind and agreed to make the movie. Though the central plot remained the same, Foreman made significant changes from the novel. Foreman expressed a desire to direct the film himself, but Columbia Pictures refused, insisting on a British director instead. The job initially went to Alexander McKendrick, but he was fired by Foreman a week before shooting began due to what was called creative differences. He was then replaced by J. Lee Thompson. The desired locations for filming were the island of Rhodes and various other spots in and around Greece. This required the cooperation of the Greek government, and they didn't disappoint at all. I found the Greek government's level of commitment and enthusiasm for this project absolutely fascinating and inspiring. One requested film location was the Acropolis in Athens. At the time, it was under extensive repair. The government agreed to take down all the scaffolding so that the scenes could be shot. Then after shooting, they put the scaffolding back up so the repairs could continue. They also provided hundreds of policemen to keep back and control curious spectators. They provided skilled mountain climbers as doubles for the leading actors. For the shots of the British Navy in the Aegean Sea, battleships from the Greek Navy were made available to the film crew. The Greek Navy also provided the transportation of the production crew and its equipment from the mainland to the island of Rhodes. They provided an invasion force complete to the last bullet. The desired location for filming of the invasion was located just off the shores of Turkey in the demilitarized zone set by way of a peace treaty between the two countries. So the foreign ministers of both Greece and Turkey had to agree to amend the treaty just for the making of the film. And then finally, to accommodate the stars, the production crew, and the family members, 
for the duration of the film, the island's newest, largest, and most expensive hotel was provided for them. The same caterer who provided the meals for the cast and crew of the Bridge Over the River Kwai was chosen for the film too. They figured if they could set up the service in the jungles, he would definitely be able to set it up on the island of Rhodes. Following the completion of the screenplay, Foreman put himself to task finding the right actors. The role of Andrea Stavros went to Anthony Quinn, his first choice. His selection of Anthony Quayle for the role of Major Roy Franklin posed no problems either. William Holden was the first actor sought to play Captain Mallory. He turned the offer down because he felt the role was just too similar to the character he had played in The Bridge on the River Kwai just three years earlier. Rock Hudson and Cary Grant were also briefly considered for the role before Gregory Peck finally was cast for it. The casting for the role of Miller also had its problems. English actor Kenneth Moore was initially chosen for the part, but he offended the head of Rank Studios, John Davis, during a BAFTA dinner and was immediately fired. Dean Martin and Sir Alex Guinness were considered for the role of Corporal John Anthony Miller as well, before David Niven finally secured the role. James Darren was cast as Private Spiros Papademus with high hopes that it would get him out of the teen idol phase. Apart from James Darren, all the actors were too old for their character roles. This led the British press to nickname the film Elderly Gang Goes Off to War. According to the book The Making of the Guns of Navarone, by Scottish film historian Brian Hannon. Opera superstar Maria Callas was set to make her movie debut in the Carl Foreman war film. At that time, Maria Callas was the most famous woman in the world, a fiery mixture of Princess Diana and Madonna. She was the role model for every diva to come. Names did not come any bigger than hers, and she was the first choice for the role of the female Greek freedom fighter, Maria Papademus. Producer Carl Foreman promised mucho love scenes with star Gregory Peck. Her career had been riddled with clashes, and insiders predicted the relationship with Foreman wouldn't last at all. Sure enough, she abruptly quit the production before shooting ever began and she was replaced by the classical actress and singer, Irene Pappas. Now, reportedly, there was great tension between many of the stars on the set. Quinn versus Quayle and Nevin versus Peck, but especially Gregory Peck versus Anthony Quinn early in the film's production. They had their run-ins, but Quinn brought several miniature chess sets with him each day to the set. These off-screen chess matches became extremely popular and eventually they helped to diffuse the many on-screen rivalries. Through this process, Gregory Peck and David Niven became very close friends. They bonded initially over Peck's ability to consume vast quantities of brandy, which the actors used to stay warm. Their families visited each other frequently in the later years, and Peck would deliver the eulogy at Nevin's funeral. As mentioned before, the Greek island of Rhodes served as the primary filming location. The cast and production crew were there from April to July of 1960. Anthony Quinn was so attracted to the area that he bought land there. The area is still called Anthony Quinn Bay, though the Greek government reclaimed it in 1984. Once filming was completed there, four more months of shooting still remained at the studio. The twin gun Navarone prop was the largest film set ever built up to that time. It was three stories high and over 80 feet long. Each gun 
weighed over 15 tons, and the total price tag was over 100,000 British pounds. It also ended up being the most costly film set ever built because soaking rains came, softening the ground, and causing the entire prop to collapse. It had to be built for a second time. The scene where the commandos scale the vertical cliff, the rock face was a painted backdrop laid on the ground. The actors were actually climbing over the studio floor, and then the image was tilted in the camera. The last sequence shot was the actual setting of the bombs. With three days left to shoot, David Niven was grounded by an infection from a split lip that he sustained while shooting in the studio. While the doctors tried to identify the infection so they could treat it properly, the production came to a halt for an entire month. Eventually, Nevin would defy his doctor's orders and return to the set to finish the movie before he was fully recovered. The relapse that then resulted put him in the hospital for seven weeks. Although The Guns of Navarone is an action-packed, suspenseful, epic, wartime motion picture, the film's message does anything but idealize war. I find that one of the most intriguing aspects of this film is the dilemma or predicament that many of the characters outwardly express that they find themselves in. Namely, David Niven's character, Corporal Miller, who expresses his hatred for even the idea of war, yet he is in it. And then there's Gregory Peck's character, Mallory, who has an introspective moment where he questions if what he is doing is even civilized, yet he's there too. This is the fascinating story within the story. I hope you will look for these aspects of the film the next time you watch it. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.